Howdy folks, Jeremy KF7IJZ, co-host of the Ham Radio 360 podcast here. In this video, I'm going to walk you through some of the hardware considerations for building your own Raspberry Pi based cluster. I'm going to walk you through specifically constructing a cluster out of the recently released Raspberry Pi 3. Now, I'm going to call this a quote unquote cluster because today we're just going to cover the hardware, powering, interconnects, network, things like that. But at the end of the day, there are many different definitions of a cluster. For instance, as I'm using these in Einstein at home, I don't have any type of central orchestration on a single node that's then distributing work to other nodes in the cluster. Whereas there are different topologies and technologies out there that would allow you to have central orchestration with true multiprocessing. But today again, we're going to focus mainly on the hardware construction. The design of my cluster was really based around the fact that I had located an 8 port 10100 Ethernet switch that was able to be powered by a USB. I really liked the idea of having a single USB power supply for everything that I was doing with my clusters. And since there were 8 ports in the switch, that limited me to having 8 nodes in the cluster. So if we look at the diagram, there is a single node, the RPi3-0, that kind of acts as the gateway and master control for the individual components in the cluster. That unit is connected via Wi-Fi to my home network. Uh, through my router, it can get to the internet. And then I will run a DHCP server and run NAT, or network address translation, on there so that all the other nodes in the cluster can get to the internet. Even though all the Raspberry Pi 3s have Wi-Fi on board, I decided I wanted to use wired networking. I decided that I would leave Wi-Fi off for all of those machines so they'll be on their own isolated network and I won't have as much wireless traffic going on. Technically, you could do everything I'm about to do and skip all of the DHCP parts and skip the need for a switch and just use Wi-Fi on the boards, but again, for me, I wanted to have wired networking. You'll see that the other nodes 1 through 7 are basically all configured identically and will get an IP address from node 0 and they'll be on a separate network, in my case 192.168.2.x. The fan, the switch, and the Raspberry Pis are all powered by a USB. Here you see the Raspberry Pi 3 and all four cores are currently utilized running Einstein at home. You'll notice from the meter in the bottom right hand corner, which is a power meter, that total power consumption at full utilization, uh, this is just for the Raspberry Pi, is approximately between 3.4 and at its peak about 3.7 watts. So to make the math easy, we'll round that up to 4 watts per Pi. That is well within the specification of what's able to be provided by the power supply that we've selected, which we'll talk more about later. I also needed to see what kind of heat was generated. This completely utilizes all four CPUs, as you can see. I wanted to get a rough idea of what it ran at, and in this case, 49.4 degrees C. That's not bad, considering the heat limit is around 80 to 85. So if I knew I could manage the heat with the fan on, I was very curious to know how it would do without a fan, because ideally we wouldn't have fans running to cool the stack. I'm gonna use the watch command. Minus N is a time, two is seconds, and this will repeat the command, VC Gen CMD, measure underscore temp, for us every two seconds. You'll see the temperature change here, and you'll see the time change here, and it updates about every two seconds. Now let's see what happens when you take the fan away. Now the ambient temperature in my room is about 74 degrees. I was actually kind of surprised that the temperature did not increase more quickly than it does. I've sped this up considerably, but it takes approximately five and a half minutes to get to maximum temperature. So you can see we top out around 75 degrees, which is still under the temperature at which the CPU will start throttling. However, when we arrange all of these pies in a vertical stack, this will be unacceptable. And so the learning here is that you really do need a fan. Let's put the fan back on and watch how quickly it cools down. Now the five volt fans that I'm using really don't have a high amount of volume or a high amount of pressure. And, but you can still see how effective they are at cooling the thing down. Now that we know this is feasible, let's get our hardware together. First of all, you're going to need 8 Raspberry Pi 3s. I purchased all of these from Micro Center for $30 a piece, which is a really good deal. Of course, every Pi needs a micro SD card. 
Now I specifically chose these Samsung 16 gigabyte Evo cards because they were available for less than $10. Uh, most of these were purchased at Micro Center, but some of them came from Amazon. I've been using these in Pies for over a year in a cluster and have had zero failures. So I'm gonna stick with these Samsungs. To cool each pie, we'll need heat sinks. I chose these Omol ones from Amazon because they all have 3M thermal tape on the back and they're the same size profile that I've been using. These are available on Amazon for $5 for two sets of heat sinks. Each set comes with one main Pi CPU heat sink and then two smaller heat sinks if you want to put it on the Ethernet controller or the RAM controller. I don't use the smaller heat sinks myself. Because I'm powering everything with USB, I will need eight USB power cables to power the Raspberry Pis. The Raspberry Pi is very sensitive to low voltage conditions. This is sometimes the reason why we see the rainbow square in the top right hand corner. It means that it's not getting the five volts that it needs. To combat this, we need to make sure we do everything possible to make sure that there is a low voltage drop when the Raspberry Pi is fully utilized. To do this, I've selected Anker power line cables, which are designed to have larger positive and negative leads inside for carrying power than an average USB cable. And also I've chosen to go with one foot length cables to also minimize that loss over distance. Next, we need a way to physically assemble all the pies together in a physical cluster. For that, we're going to use these nylon standoffs that I found on Amazon from a company called UXCELL. -E -L -L, they sell for just a little under $14 a bag. These nylon standards are M2.5 thread, which is the specification for the holes on the Raspberry Pi. The standoff portion is 10 millimeters and the thread is six millimeters long. I found these standoffs to be really high quality and you'll want to get the bag of 100. I believe they're also available in smaller quantities. You'll want the 100 though because you will need at least 64 to assemble your cluster. You'll notice that I joined them together to create 20 millimeter standoffs, which is about the right height to have between each of the pies. To attach the standoffs to the switch case, which we're gonna do as we assemble the pie, we need some screws. And in this case, I was able to source some M2.5 uh, six millimeter screws from the local Home Depot. These were available for just a, under a dollar a bag and I bought two bags. As I've mentioned, I've decided to use an ethernet switch to provide networking for all the pies in the cluster. It also provides a convenient base on top of which to mount all of the Raspberry Pis. In this case, I've chosen a TrendNet TE100-S8. This is available at Micro Center or at Amazon. Uh, I was able to pick this up for about 15 bucks. I selected this particular switch because version three of the hardware is compatible with five volts and therefore compatible with USB with the appropriate cable. In order to power that switch over USB, you will need a USB to type M adapter cable. This is available on Amazon for about $5 as an add-on item. It comes from a different manufacturer's, but this one is one meter long. Because I'm using a switch and connecting all of these via ethernet, we'll need ethernet cables. We will need three 18 inch long ethernet cables, which I purchased from Amazon, and five one foot long ethernet cables, which are available from Micro Center or from Amazon. To power the cluster, you will need a powerful USB power supply. And in this case, you'll need 10 ports, eight for the Raspberry Pis, one for the cooling fans, and one for the switch. Now, this particular model, an Inland Pro 10-port smart USB charging station, is capable of providing 2.4 amps per port. This is far more than we need because as we saw, the Pis draw uh, just under four watts, which means about three quarters of an amp per Pi. Now this particular power supply is capable of eight amps total at 12 volts, meaning approximately 96 watts. This is a little less than double of what you're gonna find commonly at Amazon. So this guy was $40 at Micro Center, and unfortunately, since I've made this video, uh, I haven't seen these listed on their website or in their store. I've asked about them and have not gotten a good answer. A good alternative though on Amazon are, is a 10 port 60 watt power supply available from either Anker or Sabrent. Uh, they have two different uh, form factors. One is kind of a, a long skinny one, and the other one is more of a brick similar to this. So at that point, it would be up to your personal style preferences which one you would buy. But a 60 watt power adapter should be plenty to power your eight node Raspberry Pi cluster. 
To make sure our cluster stays nice and cool, we're finally going to need some USB fans. In this case, I found a company on Amazon called AC Infinity who make a wide assortment of USB powered fans. This particular fan is called a multi-fan. There are two 80 millimeter fans that are powered by a USB. There's a small speed controller with a high medium low setting, which is kind of useless for what we're doing because we're going to leave it on high. But this is an ideal option because it's small and compact and runs off USB natively. And uh, I found that the quality of these fans is quite good. These fans are generally available for $15 for the pair. Although looking on Amazon today, I noticed they're not available. So individual fans for available for $12. Finally, we're going to need some miscellaneous odds and ends, starting with four small black zip ties. These zip ties will be used to attach the two fans to one another so that they stand vertically to make a column of fans, which will go on the end of the pie cluster. On the right, you'll see a package of Scott's Extreme Fasteners. This is like Velcro on steroids. This is the material that I've selected to use to attach the fans to the base of the switch on the cluster. This will make sure that the fans are able to attach and be removable without being installed permanently. Now I've selected this in particular because while the fans certainly don't weigh 10 pounds, I do want something that was very sturdy in holding the fans upright. Finally in the middle you'll see that there are a series of rectangular prisms. These objects were printed on my 3D printer and their measurements are 25 inches wide by 50 inches long. And in this particular case, I, I printed out various heights to see which height I needed. When I assembled it, I found that I only needed a six millimeter high object, but I didn't know that at the time. To get started, we need to disassemble the switch, which we'll start by doing by removing these rubber feet. Now there's a light adhesive on these, so when you take them off, you'll be able to set them to the side and keep them for future use. Underneath one of the rubber feet, you'll notice that there is just plastic and no screw. This is correct and will not interfere with the disassembly of the switch. Now that the rubber feet have been removed, we'll remove the three screws that are holding the switch together. Unfortunately, we need a little bit more effort after this in order to get the switch apart. Now that the screws are out, we have to remove the top case from the bottom part of the case. And they are snapped together quite tightly. As you can see, using my fingernails alone is not enough to get the two pieces apart. To fully open the case, we're going to use a tool called a spooger. And this is a tool that commonly comes with things like iPhone repair kits. In the event that you don't have one of these, you can probably pick one up at Micro Center or other local electronic part type retailers. If you can't find one or don't want to order one or don't want to wait, another thing that's useful is a very thin putty knife. With the tool, you're going to traverse around the bottom edge of the bottom shell of the case. And as you're moving it, you should be listening for snaps to pop. For this particular switch, you'll hear those snaps pop in the back and in the front. And this step can take several tries, so just be patient and keep working at it. As you continue to work around the edge, the snaps will get progressively further and eventually you'll be able to get, say, the front edge away from the top part of the case. You'll see that I'm still having to use the spooger to act as a lever to get things separated, but again, patience pays off in the end. More than likely during disassembly, the main printed circuit board will have come loose from the bottom shell of the case. That's not really a big deal. You can go ahead and line it back up and set it to the side. Now we've gone to the trouble of removing the top half of the switch from the bottom half because it will serve as the primary base on which we will mount the Pi cluster. In this particular case, we need to drill holes to get our standoffs and our screws mounted to the case, upon which we will mount all the other Raspberry Pis. On the screen, you will see a template, which I will provide a link for that I found online. When you print this out, make sure to have it print as original size on the paper so that this template does come out the same size as the Raspberry Pi. You'll see clearly the four holes that are used to drill the holes in the top of the switch, which signify the mounting holes on the Pi's themselves. Over on the right, you'll see that I have a ruler to demonstrate that the calibration square is in fact 30 millimeter by 30 millimeter, meaning that these holes should meet the actual size of the Raspberry Pi. 
Once you have printed out this template and verified that the scale properly matches a real Raspberry Pi, you will need to carefully cut out the B Plus template. This template matches the Raspberry Pi B Plus, the Raspberry Pi 2 B Plus, and the Raspberry Pi 3 B Plus. This is the template that we will be later taping to the top of the switch case to use as our guide for drilling holes. With the front of the top shell towards us, we're gonna to wanna to mount this template kind of far to the right because we're gonna use this space to mount the fans and have the pies offset to the right so there's plenty of room over here. One thing to be aware of is depending on where we drill the holes, it's entirely possible we may conflict with these dividers which separate the LEDs from one another. You will want to align the template so that it's approximately in the front to back center of the depth of the clamshell. This will ensure that you have the flattest parts possible on the top of the case because as you can see the case does kind of round off towards the front and towards the back. Finally I'm going to use some blue painters tape because it's what I have handy to actually tape the template down. With the template taped in place, we can take one of our fans and do a test fitting to make sure there is ample room for the fan to fit. Later, we'll be removing these rubber stoppers off the fan so there'll be even more room. Now in a moment, I'm gonna use a drill press to drill these holes, but I realize not everybody has a drill press. In the event that you're gonna use a hand drill to use these, there's one tip that's really important to make sure that your holes are drilled accurately. Using a sharp tool such as this screwdriver, you're going to want to make a divot in the center of each of these holes so the drill bit has something to cup into when you're drilling by hand. We're drilling holes for these little guys and the thread is what will go through to create the standoff. Now, at the end of the day, the hole needs to be big enough for the M2 thre 2.5 thread to go through, um, but small enough that the rest of the standoff doesn't go through. So I highly recommend you start small and make the hole bigger until you get it in there. Ultimately, you want these holes to have a little bit of play in them to allow the pie to do the aligning once you connect it. And remember, ultimately, you'll only be installing one of these in on there and there will be a screw that comes up through the bottom. I'm starting with a drill bit that looks to be about the same diameter as the thread, maybe just a tiny bit more. This is a 3 30 seconds drill bit. And of course, before I drill, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring the spindle down to make sure I'm hitting in the right place. Apply some firm pressure. Bring it down. Now that we've got the basic holes in place, we're gonna do a test fit to see if that fits through. And while it would thread through, because they are almost the exact same size, maybe a little smaller, it's still too tight. So here we have our 764 bit. If you see, it is much smaller than the standoff and just a little bit bigger, tiny bit bigger than the thread. At this point, now that you're making the holes larger, it actually makes sense to go ahead and remove your template because having the, the paper in the way can make it confusing, whereas it's easier to line up the holes on their own. So now we've got four holes. What we're gonna do is we're going to insert this into the hole. You'll see that it went through just fine and there's plenty of play, which is good because when you put the Raspberry Pi on there, that'll handle the rest of the alignment. Now that we've drilled the four holes in the top of the switch case for the Raspberry Pi, we're going to install our first four standoffs. For this, you will need the four 2.5 millimeter screws and the four individual standoffs. To attach the standoffs, I find it's easiest generally to start with the screw. By putting the screw through the case, holding it with a thumb or finger, turning it back over, and screwing the standoff on top of the screw. 
Now at this time, you won't make these super tight because you want there to be a little bit of wiggle room for the pie to adjust them as you attach it. When you are finished, all four standoffs should be screwed into the top and have enough play that the Raspberry Pi will be able to adjust them when you put it on top of the case. Next, we'll remove our first Raspberry Pi from its protective static bag, and we will place it on top of the four standoffs. Make sure that the USB ports and the Ethernet port are facing to the right of the switch as the front of the switch is facing towards you. While carefully holding the Raspberry Pi, we will turn the case over and tighten all four screws. For each Pi we add, we're going to need to use eight standoffs, screwing each two together to make a total of a 20 millimeter tall standoff. At this point, we will do a test fit to make sure that the next Raspberry Pi fits on top of the stack of standoffs. In the event that our holes weren't drilled quite correctly, this is the opportunity for us to correct them. In this case, it's a little bit of a tight fit, but I do see that the Pi will fit just fine. The reason that we don't want to commit to this yet is that we still need to install the heat sink on the first Pi. For my Raspberry Pi 3 cluster, I will only be using the large CPU heat sink. Using tweezers so I avoid getting oils from my hand on the heat sink and the screwdriver from earlier, I'm going to carefully pry off the protective backing of the thermal pad material. I use the tweezers to apply the heat sink as squarely as possible to the CPU and also use them to apply a light pressure to ensure good bonding between the thermal pad and the CPU. For every pie that goes on the stack, I will attach the heat sink using the same method before applying the next pie in the stack. Now that the pies are stacked, it's time to close the switch case back up. We'll do so by inserting the bottom into the top shell and then squeezing around the corners until we hear the four snaps signifying that the case has gone back together. Now we'll turn the cluster upside down to reinsert the three screws that hold the case together as well as reattach the rubber feet. Now we'll connect each pie to the switch using ethernet cables. The three 18 inch long cables will be used for the top three pies. Now we'll insert the micro USB power cables into each pie. To assemble the cooling stack, we're gonna to wanna to remove all of these rubber pads that come on these fans. Next, we'll want to line the fans up so that the arrows that indicate the direction of airflow are aligned in the same direction. Now we'll need the four zip ties from earlier. We'll push them through the holes, join them together on one side, and then do the other. Make sure to pull them very tight, trim them with scissors, and now our fans are stacked together. At this point, if you've not already done so, you'll want to pause and make sure that you've created your software images and load them onto the micro SD cards, because now we're going to install them in the Pi cluster. Now I will be covering software, the installation of Raspbian, and the configuration of Einstein at Home, which is the package that I run on my Pi clusters, in a later video. Now we'll adhere a set of the Scotch fasteners to either side of our spacer. Again, the spacer is 25 millimeters by 50 millimeters by six millimeters tall. Finally, we'll attach the fasteners and the spacer to the bottom of the fan, and then ultimately onto the switch, using very firm pressure to ensure good contact. The spacer height was chosen to ensure that airflow from both fans passed over both the bottom Raspberry Pi as well as the top Raspberry Pi heat sinks. And that's it. Just plug your Pi cluster in, let it boot up, and do any final software configuration that you need to do. The Pi clusters are useful little devices that can be used for anything from participating in a distributed computing project such as Einstein at Home or SETI at Home. They can also be used to build a learning tool so that you can learn about things like Docker or learn about configuration tools such as Ansible or Chef and Puppet. This Pi cluster has 32 computing cores with 8 gigs of RAM available to it, allowing you to use it to simulate many things that require large-scale computing projects. In a future video, I'll walk you through the software configuration that I use when configuring my Pi clusters for use with Einstein at home. Thanks for watching.